Dr. Scott Lyons. What a pleasure it is to talk to you and meet you and talk to you about your book. I just, everyone loves this title, I know. Addicted to Drama and everyone immediately wants to know, okay, tell me more. Because as you say, when you ask lecture in an audience and you say, do you know anyone who's addicted to drama? People put up both hands and then you say, are you addicted to drama? And they don't put up their own hands. So you artfully walk us through what does it mean to be addicted to drama and you know, how can we maybe recognize it in ourselves and others? You have an assessment, you have great pointers. There's a lot of stuff that we can really get into that I think is going to help a lot of people. But you unpack it in a way that's really not the way people are going to, are expecting to hear about it. So I'm very excited to have you on the show today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure. That's a, it's a pleasure for me too. Okay, Scott, you have a great backstory. I'd love you to start by just telling us a little bit about your story and how that led into you actually writing this book. Yeah. Well, I have a great lineage of addiction to drama. I come from many, <laughs> many members of my family who I can yeah. delightfully say are, are addicted to drama. And, and I mean that with a lot of heart, actually. I know. <laughs> that I, I recognize the, the pain in it, and I recognize the, the, the playfulness that also sometimes comes with that. And so it wasn't a big surprise to find that I myself have it, have had that experience, have adopted that as my own process for living, my own process for navigating my own trauma. And so that really, you know, as I was growing up in the arts and I was finding myself in relationships that we might call toxic, but really I was partly responsible for those, if not more responsible than other people, and finding myself in constant situations that we would call chaos and constant crises, and not realizing at the time that I was a contributor, that I was contributing to my own suffering, my own hurt, my own pain. And in fact, I thought I was thriving. I experienced a lot of energy. I had an exciting life. And at a certain point, things kept colliding. There were too many stressors to navigate. My sort of threshold for what I thought was, you know, part of life became consuming. And I crashed. And I crashed hard. And I kept finding myself back in certain scenarios and situations. Even with family members who were trying to support me and love me, I'd find myself fighting with them and feeling a little bit better afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I had to pause and go, this doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Why is it that I find myself, I would, I was in the arts for a long time. And, and when I crashed, I, I dabbled back in the arts and I would find sort of the constant stress of it supportive. And so I began to recognize my own addiction to independency on chaos and crisis as a way of living and recognizing that it was my normal. It was my baseline way of living. Yeah. Wow. And it mm -hmm. truly wasn't until I began to give myself space from that, which was absolutely hard and painful. I can imagine. <laughs> as we might imagine, any withdrawal from an addiction might yeah. be. That I began to recognize how much I was chasing the drama as a way of avoiding my underlying trauma. So that's where you bring yeah. in the addiction component, which is always the classic reason for any addiction is there's an underlying trauma yeah. and you're trying to avoid facing the trauma. So people don't yeah. really classify being addicted to drama and the, and the pension, pension for drama and chaos as an addiction. But you explain in this book that this is how we need to look at this concept. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the very classical model of addiction is very, it's medicalized. It's very mm, like, very. this is a chemical issue. And we really expanded that in the last 20 years. Thank goodness. Really <laughs> to a point where we mm. truly recognize it's a biopsychosocial model. Exactly. There are so many contr contributions to it, including transgenerational trauma, trauma in general, pain. What are the ways that we are supporting ourselves not to be in our pain. Mm -hmm. And I'm using that phrasing very carefully. What yeah. are the ways we are supporting ourselves not to be in that pain? Because mm. as humans, we can only hold so much pain. Mm. That's and we so can only true. process so much at a time. Mm -hmm. 
So link this now for me to how this processing of pain and one of the mm-hmm. ways we get, you know, we co- as a coping strategy, why you've specifically, obviously it's your, in your own life, the experience of your own life, yeah. but you obviously work with people, you've developed assessments, yeah. you've, you, you practice clinically. And yeah. so you're working with people who are battling with this. So can you link, so sitting with our pain and, and the pain related to, to addiction to drama, can you help, under, help, help us understand that? Yeah. So I think what's helpful when, when unpacking an addiction to drama is how do we see it on the outside? How do we see it from the in, experience it from the inside, from in, within the drama, within the addiction? And then why? And I think if, if we That's might good. start with what does it look like on the outside? I like that. Because, Let's do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because as I mentioned, every time I've ever given a talk about it, everyone knows someone addicted to drama. Yeah. In fact, you know, when I've ran into people on the street and they ask me what I do, and I just, I mentioned I wrote a book and so many times when I mentioned the title of the book, they're like, will you interview my family? <laughs> and will you talk to my family? Will you do a it. TV show with my family? <laughs> and, and my question is always right back of like, what is it that you notice? What is it like something in you knows they're addicted to drama so what mm-hmm. is it? What do you recognize in their behaviors and their way of existing in the world? And, you know, some of the most common things are like, you know, when we just are asking ourselves, whoa, 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 what just happened? <laughs> yeah. I am like, how did we get here? And in, in, in a situation in the, the eruption of an event that wasn't such a big deal, but now feels like it's such a big deal where the intensity and the extremes of the response do not match the circumstances to which they exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can all relate to those experiences. <laughs> yeah. And, and so we know it so well in our culture. We know mm-hmm. addiction to drama. We see it. And, you know, for, in my own experience, I went from recognizing it in other people and then recognizing it in myself and then seeking help and realizing there was no literature. There's no scientific journals. There's no unpacking of the science of this, but how is it that we all know it and there's no science to support it? Very no good question. literature. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that, I, that's a gap I wanted to fill. And from the inside you know, we, we, and we're naming some of the pieces of what it feels like or looks like on the outside. It, and it feels like, again, I'm going to go switch back actually to the outside where it feels like someone has vacuumed the air out of the room. There's no <laughs> space for us. There's only mm. space for them. And suddenly we are feel enwrapped in what is happening within them. Mm. We find ourselves getting stressed out just by being in the vicinity of them. And then That's it feels such like a good description. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tornado. They wrap us in their tornado in the book. I call it a whirlwind, but it's really a, like a tornado that, that just mm. keeps picking up speed. And part of you coming into it is what gives it the battery pack of picking up the speed and getting more people involved. That's so true. I like the tornado concept because, you know, it does pick up things in its wake. So as it rolls through and, in this destructive, you can't miss it way. It's picking up <laughs> yeah. all kinds of things. It picks up anything it can and distorts it, distorts it as energy to continue the pattern, whatever it takes to avoid the pain, whatever mm. it takes. So from the inside, and I can say this from interviewing hundreds of people, but also from my own experience, it feels like the world is constantly against you. It feels like it's col- like everything's colliding and that you can't get yourself out of it. It feels like a constant urgency. Like you can never outrun the stressors that are coming at you. And it, there's a sense of dis-ease. Mm. Wherever you go, it's pervasive. Like, you know, something's going to be wrong, but you can't quite name what it is. And so you search for it and you search for it and you either create it or you find it. So you finally feel like a relief from that sense of searching and searching for something you know is going to go wrong. And if you don't find it? And if you don't find it, you create it. 
because there's that <laughs> sense of being out of sync yeah. with the world. The world is happening, but something in you feels either slower or faster, just out of sync, out of rhythm mm -hmm. with this, with the world as it is. And we, what is really interesting is that through our senses and our experiences of trauma, our senses begin to distort. So, you know, the information coming in through our ears, the information coming in through the way we experience touch, all of that begins, the barometer of that begins to be distorted. So our, even our sense of timing in the world through trauma begins to be distorted. Like and in the book, I give the example, if you've ever been late to an appointment or late to go get a flight or late and you're driving in the car yeah. and you feel like everyone is driving so slow. <laughs> Yeah. But in actuality, they're driving at the same pace you are. But the the arousal energy, the activation, the stress uh -huh, energy the distortion. You mm -hmm. creates the distortion. And then when that mm -hmm. becomes your baseline, there's a constant sense of distortion. So when we say, oh, that person is so intense and so extreme in their response, inside they're not. It's justified. Because the filter to which they are receiving the sensory information of the world is distorted. And so they are mm. responding true to the way they are experiencing the world. They're just responding to the baseline and keeping themselves at yeah. the baseline. Absolutely. And that baseline is what's distorted and that baseline is the disruption. So therefore you have to go and search under the baseline to yeah. literally rewire the baseline. Yeah. And it takes a lot of time and patience to go underneath because there's a threshold. When you drop beneath the baseline, there's an alarm system that goes off mm -hmm. that says, this isn't safe. And what's underneath that baseline is often the pain, the deep core wound. And so we have this innate alarm system that keeps us, the, and when I say us, humans, yeah. Yeah. But especially yeah. those who've experienced trauma or and who have a propensity for an addiction to, to drama, it keeps us from contacting the deeper wounds because it, there is a, that is what is our sense of safety is to stay away mm. from the pain that is there. Mm -hmm. And that's so much the pattern of any kind of addiction. So it falls within <clears throat> that. That's really amazing. You, you actually have some I'm trying to find what page it is, just to give people some more specific examples. You talk about yes. the multi-layered pattern and with feedback loops surrounding a core internal experience that often manifests in the following way. So that's pretty much what you've just described, like right mm -hmm. down deep in what I would call the yeah. unconscious mind is your is yeah. the experience and that and it's a yeah. traumatic experience. And then your yeah. unconscious mind is trying to protect you by making yeah. you aware of it because you need to deal with it. But that awareness. It, because you and you can't hear that awareness. I'm just repeating. Just tell me if I understood you correctly. You've got this incorrect baseline that has been established as a coping mechanism to the trauma. And that baseline has said, if I go anywhere below this, if I pay attention to what my mind-body-brain connection is telling me to do, my psychoneurobiology, the, you, because you work in this field of, as well, yeah. is uh, that's not going to be safe for me. But that's, yeah. it is safe, but it doesn't feel safe. So it keeps you yeah. stuck. So yeah. is, that, is that correct? So that stuckness yeah. manifests in certain ways. So what I'd love to do now is talk through some of those. And yeah. then I know everyone's yeah. thinking, okay, well, if that's the case, you know, what do we do? <laughs> how do we do it? And what do, how do we fix it? And obviously it's a long, it's not something we can fix on a podcast, but you can certainly point them in the right direction. So can I, I, I think you've, you've covered a little bit here, but can I go into, or do you, mm -hmm. can we go into a little bit of the detail about these yeah. multi-layered patterns? So you talk about things like feeling out of control, perceiving the world mm -hmm. in, in an extreme or intense to, um, way, living with that pervasive sense of isolation, betrayal, abandonment, and uneasiness, and feeling numb much of the time, and having a sense of self that fluctuates and disperses, often becoming unanchored. Do, do you want to take a couple of those and just dive in a little yeah. bit? Yeah. So let's talk about isolation. Okay. Because we know that from an attachment perspective, so our mm -hmm. early developmental patterns, that when we come into this world, when we're not met with another caregiver or a human being or an environment that can help regulate our nervous system, that can help meet our needs, 
we do we don't get the opportunity to develop that sense of self-regulation, the capacity to be present and address and metabolize our own processes and, and emotions and let alone express them into the world, express our needs. And so we get stunted in that authentic expression, that authentic experience of ourself. Mm-hmm. And when we don't get met from a very early experience, and we don't get to express ourselves, it creates this sense of isolation, this disconnect. And in that that last, wherever you are, even in relationship. And so it even and it's an inability that that also forms of feeling and being able to receive love. Because the vulnerability mm. of receiving love to the degree that might actually be there would create an opening. And that same opening might get to that place of core wound. Well, you had that experience in one of your yeah. relationships. You talk yeah. about that in yeah. one of your relationships. And that was kind of almost like a realization for you. And it got so bad yeah. that you ended up, not just that relationship, but the accumulation from there that you ended up in and out of hospital and when you were growing up, but you ended up with a quite a severe cardiovascular event. You were suffering with TIAs. Yeah. So, I mean, this is yeah. transient ischemic attacks. So this is what yeah. you, the, the playing out in our body when we don't deal with our stuff, it was very yeah. evident in your life. Yeah. I mean, when we think about, you know, stress, we often associate it with these diseases, with these harmful things mm-hmm. and a little tiny adaptation about what stress is, which is yeah. important to recognize stress is not the villain. Exactly. It's, it's our inability yeah. to mobilize the, all that activation within us. So we have an activation response that gets us ready to adapt in the world. Exactly. We and have to have that or we wouldn't survive. Yeah. And we wouldn't be alive. We wouldn't survive. Exactly. And when we are not able to express ourselves, mobilize that energy, then it becomes encased within us and it becomes like an inflammatory response in our body. And we see autoimmune responses that are signaling, yeah. hey, we didn't process all this extra activation, this all, all this extra cortisol, and we're going to keep getting louder until you process it, exactly. until you mobilize it. And that manifests so often as disease. Exactly. There's signals. There's signals from the mind body saying, hey, something has not been processed through and metabolized. Mm-hmm. And we might experience that as fibromyalgia. We might feel that as chronic fatigue. We might feel that as just ache constantly, ache in our joints, or as ADHD, or as so many other manifestations. And the underlying piece of that, often, when you ask anyone who's addicted to drama, there's a sense of that dis-ease, but there's also coupled with a sense of isolation. No one's ever really there for you, Mm. even when they are. Because actually receiving someone, truly receiving someone. It's going to open up that wound. Mm -hmm. It's going to open up the wound. And so we stay in the pattern. So before we talk about, because obviously patterns can be broken and yeah. that's something that, that we're going to get into, you developed yeah. a little, when I say fun assessment, it's, it's a, a fairly informal assessment, but it helps people yeah. to be able to work out if they, others are addicted to drama or if they're addicted <laughs> to drama. So do you want to yeah. talk a little bit about that assessment and then let's dive in a little bit to how we can actually start dealing with this when, if we recognize it in ourselves or helping someone else. Let's, let's handle both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I made this assessment and, you know, I've worked, I've worked it through. We've, we've certainly asked, we've given it to people who I self-identified as addicted to drama and uh, to folks who also know lots of people addicted to drama. Those who put both hands up when asked, do you know someone addicted to drama? Mm-hmm. And the assessment is actually also available on the website. If you just want to take the assessment before getting the book, you're welcome to. It's on my website, which we'll put up. Yes, we'll put up in the show notes. There are questions on there. And, you know, the first assessment is, do I know someone addicted to drama? And the second assessment is, am I? Which is always a harder assessment. And so sometimes we need to also rely on cues from outside people of going when, when we're answering those questions for ourselves. So this would be the first place for someone to start 
is to yeah. is to you know just find out if they are or if someone else is or you know both and or or both. Yeah. So do you want to go yeah. through some of the questions just very quickly so the yeah. listeners can get a feel? Yeah. This is from the first assessment. Does someone you know feel anxious or bored when things are calm? After interacting with them, do you find yourself going, wait, what just happened? They make mountains out of molehills. Their reactions are bigger than what makes sense. And these, you know, in, in answering this, the invitation is always to think, is it never, seldom, sometimes, frequent, always? You get pull, they pull people into their crisis. They crave extreme situations and sensations. That could be pleasure, that could be activities, that could be pain. They generalize one bad situation and make it universal. So they go from, that was a bad day to, oh, my life is so hard. And it's a constant of that. Mm -hmm. They might go crisis hopping. So crisis hopping is a term I use when clients start talking about one, one challenge in their life. And as soon as we start to process through it, they jump to the next one. Another one. Yeah. And then they just keep jumping. Before they've even got one part resolved. Absolutely. Because the resolve would bring them too close to underneath the threshold the or underneath the mm -hmm. baseline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They enjoy being provocative, rousing controversy. The closer people get to them, the more destructive they become. And we know relationships are such a vehicle to manifest what is needed in an addiction to drama. Mm -hmm. And I say needed because it's, again, we, we're in the place where we need to create or we need to find the things that create that rousing response. Mm -hmm. And that level of being involved in chaos and crisis, and it might sound strange to a lot of mm -hmm. us, but it also gives us a sense of meaning and purpose. We're involved in something. We're involved in something big. And it gives us a sense of power. Powerlessness is such, an, a, a, such a big piece of any addiction. Mm -hmm. And when we've in, in an addiction to drama, they'll often feel powerless unless they're in that height and that heightened state mm -hmm. of being in the crisis, navigating it, creating it, whatever part they are in of it. And it gives them a sense of power. It gives them a sense of meaning. It gives them a sense of purpose, all which are eradicated when you are totally in a place of isolation and dis-ease and feel like mm -hmm. you are a victim to all that is coming at you, which as we talked about with that sensory yeah. distortion is true. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. With the, the yeah. car example that you gave earlier on, you late and it feels like everyone else is driving slow, but it's the distortion. So you're seeing it through a distortions and addiction does that. It distorts the lens and the outlook. Yeah. And so what essentially you're yeah. saying is that drama is playing out in the same kind of way, which I don't think people really realize that. It's it's a really great... Yeah. Did you want to handle some more questions or do you want to move to the yeah. second assessment? Yeah. I mean, we can um, keep bringing some more in. Everything they say or do feels urgent. Mm, they that's have a good big one. loves and big breakups. <laughs> I think we all know someone like that, maybe even ourselves. Yeah. And if you're thinking, as I'm as I'm reading these, you're like, oh, wait, that sounds a little familiar to me. I will say that by the end of the second part of the book, you might recognize your own propensity for addiction to drama a little bit more, as it's so prevalent in our culture. And the ways in which social media and media itself are creating the conditions mm -hmm. to replicate the individual experiences that created that. So maybe 20, 40, 50 years ago, we had a mm -hmm. lot of individual conditions that create individual individuals' addiction to drama. Mm -hmm. And now we have replicated that those chaotic environments, the overstimulation, the, un, the, the lack of time and support to process. We've replicated that on a much bigger field. Mm. That makes sense. Mm. 
Yeah. So we might find ourselves as we're reading some of the assessment about someone we know that there's some level of it that feels familiar for us. It's so true. It's, it's that, you know, society, every change in every generation brings a new challenge. And this yeah. really is, you know, one of the challenges because, it, you know, it's very easy to get sucked into drama now. It's yeah. quicker. It's just yeah. the speed at which it happens makes it much more yeah. accessible. And therefore your, your immersion is, is like a full immersion versus a little yeah. drip of a tap. Now it's like a full on thunderstorm all over you kind of thing. <laughs> and that's, we have to realize yeah. and recognize that because it's, so people that yeah. may not have had a massive issue with drama, it's almost mm. can be unavoidable in our current society. If I'm hearing you correctly, yeah. this is what you're saying. Yeah. Is. So it's something it, we should all be the, alert to and aware of. It's in the same way that someone can grow up with a secure attachment in themselves and in relationships. Mm -hmm. And in relation to someone who has an insecure attachment, their attachment style can actually change. And so mm -hmm. those with an addiction to drama are pulling you in because that is the way that they can connect. If you are in sync inside the tornado, mm -hmm. it is safe enough to be in relationship to you. And there is momentary, a beautiful moment, momentary moment, short-lived, of feeling belonging, a feeling connection. Mm -hmm. Which is what everyone craves which is what everyone craves. And that deep isolation pain that is such a core wound for those with an addiction to drama is momentarily relieved. And so of course they crave it. They're going to keep doing it. And when they don't have it, they're going to go default back to that sense of aloneness. And mm. when they pull you in, when they bring you in proxy to that sense of crisis and chaos that they are both feeling within them and creating it's contagious so mm -hmm. some of my favorite science is called stress contagion mm -hmm. and it says that i even in my own stress response just sitting here those of you who are listening or actually watching will have the same or similar stress response in your own body and you might not even recognize mm -hmm. it and it's an evolutionarily brilliant component of our biology mm -hmm. meaning if i'm running into a room that you're in after seeing a giant bear that's chasing me and you just you don't have to know that i'm being chased by a bear your whole body mind activates in in a mirrored response to mine to get you prepared to adapt absolutely and so those with an addiction to trauma are utilizing that unbeknownst to them. And utilizing it, that yeah, in a distorted way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So it's almost like a distortion of empathy. So we're tuning in because we naturally become entangled in each other's, as you say, yeah. the contagion, the stress, law of entanglement, all these things. So we, it's, it's going to happen. But if we don't recognize it in ourselves and in yeah. others, we can get sucked into something that can make us all feel terrible because yeah. it can have it's so it's so draining so it's to know yeah. how to so the next question i want to ask you is how then if you are in that situation and you know someone who's sucking you in what do you do how do you protect yourself that's a great question so there's a there's a lot of different strategies we might take but the first is to start to recognize for yourself if you lose anchor if you lose mm -hmm. a sense of ground in the presence of someone else just bringing in that awareness is the first part of navigating it. If you aren't aware that you might recognize it afterwards of like, oh, why am I so exhausted? That mm -hmm. person is so exhausting. But if you track it back a little bit, at some point, you left your own ability to metabolize the stress. You left your body. You got pulled into theirs, into mm -hmm. their tornado. You lost your anchor momentarily. And so the first piece of that is awareness. I might, you might experience that as just less connection to your body or less sense of like ground or weight. Or exhaustion or, or a little bit of exhaustion. Yeah. A sense of Usually disturbance. Usually by the time we're exhausted, it's, it's a little too late. Okay. <laughs> Meaning that we're, we've already been pulled out and the exhaustion is, a is, is letting us, is a symptom of that we didn't process our own experience, but we went through an entire experience. Mm -hmm. So it's starting to drain you. So the awareness, yeah. we need to develop an awareness yeah. that something's mm -hmm. 
not something's making me feel disturbed. My peace is getting disturbed yeah. or. Yeah. And so the next piece of that is to come back, whether it's well, come back into the present of your own body. So there's lots of strategies for that. It might be building up saliva in your mouth and swallowing and just feeling the saliva, feeling the warmth of your breath, feeling weight back in your body, squeezing your fists, just so you can feel some sense of muscularity in your body and then releasing it. These are all, and there's many more strategies of coming mm -hmm. back into the presence of your body. And then once you're there, you can begin to identify how close do you want to be? So then it becomes a choice. Do I want to be involved in this? Maybe I do, but mm -hmm. often we don't. And so we might start to assert our boundary. We might say things like, hey, this is all the time I have for you today. I need to take a break. Or it might be taking a few literal steps back in the space. Mm -hmm. It might be identifying with them that like, I have five more minutes for you. Because often when we interrupt that, it it becomes it escalates. Mm. So it's a it's a delicate oh, balance between to asserting know your how boundary. to uh, yeah how yeah. to do it. Because as you you're quite right. Because if you you say to someone, you know, hey, mm. you overreacting or something, which is kind of almost a natural reaction. That's just going to explode the volcano even more. It's like another. I mean, a, a a second tornado on top of the first tornado. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got multiple twisters going on at the same time. There we it's go. a perfect storm. <laughs> yeah. A perfect storm. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and these are the things, those might be more trigger words for them of like, mm. you're overreacting because they're yeah. not from their internal experience because mm. they didn't realize they were pouring fuel on top of the, the fire that they had created mm. or found. And so same things like you're overreacting, you're too much, anything like that is just going to add over more fuel. To fire. You, you're oversensitive. Calm down. Yeah. You know, those are all the trigger things that mm -hmm. are just going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's important in that moment to say, I really hear there's a lot going on right now and I need to pause. I need to pause so that I can come back and be more present with mm -hmm. you, which is ultimately what I know is going to be most supportive to you. And to not add things to the fire, don't, you know, when they ask, when they start talking about other people, when they're gossiping, when they're doing any of that, don't say, oh my gosh, they're the worst. Don't add to the fire. Just say, because it's going to get out you. of control. Mm, okay. You said, just that say, sounds I hear really, you. Yeah. I, that sounds really hard for you. That's really intense. I'm sorry. That's the experience you're having right now. It's really short word sentences that don't add logs to the fire and maintaining your boundary, identifying what you're willing to say yes and no to in this moment and keep grounding yourself, keep anchoring. The more you let yourself come into their twister, the less power you have. Mm -hmm. And the less power you have, the less capacity you have to regulate what's happening within you and that's where the exhaustion is. That's where you're essentially having the same biochemical response as they are. Mm -hmm. It's it's secondhand yeah. drama. Mm -hmm. There we go. I was, I was about to say that the urgency yeah. has become your emergency or the emergency you know, it's, it has turned around and distorted. Yeah. Okay, let's talk. Yeah. This is fascinating. Let's talk about identifying it in oneself because I think that's always, yeah. Yeah. especially with our, yeah. as you as you mentioned, the current culture, which is, just the speed at which we can get caught up in drama and how everything is so dramatic, you know, drama sells and everything is yeah. dramatic from politics to everything. It's just every TikTok. It's, yeah. it's just, it's a, it's a very dramatic world that we do live in and it's easy we to do. access it. Very easy to access it. There's a giant stage waiting for us to enact our dramas and there are little like buttons that support <laughs> it. And a drama yeah. doesn't have to mean it. It's just crisis. Exactly. The drama can be, that it's something that isn't authentically true and at its exact amount. So like when we write a simple post on, on Instagram, for example, mm -hmm. I always, with my clients, I say, what are you really hungry for in that moment? Are you overriding your need and supporting yourself in that need and attempting to get it in an indirect way 
through sharing a photo, through using certain more extreme words within the caption. You know, and that's that is one of the questions we ask in the assessment is what is the the language you often use? Are you using more extremes in your language like always, never? Mm-hmm. You know, a good this example is self, of that is is this the self-assessment now that we're in that you assessment yeah, too? But do yeah. I have a propensity for drama? That's the this assessment yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. And words like extremely, literally, always, very, really, never. These are words we might hear ourselves say constantly. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, I was sharing the assessment with a friend and she was like, oh, that's the only words in my teenager's vocabulary. <laughs> and, you know, there's a, a story in the book about my mom when we were at someone's house uh, with a teenager who went from zero to hundred very quick. And then I used some of my fun psychology tricks to bring, to co-regulate them and bring yeah. them back down. And then that teenager went away for about 20 minutes onto a zoom call with some of her classmates and they were drama bonding. So they were, they were throwing logs on each other's fire and you could hear it getting louder and louder from downstairs. And then she came back up the stairs after she got off the call and she was more intense than when she came home from school and was already Mm -hmm. at a hundred. She was at 180 on a scale of zero to a hundred. And my mom leaned over to me and she was like, don't, don't go in. (laughs) You're just going to make it worse. And I was like, no, no, no. I'm a professional. I got this. And indeed, (laughs) I made some very amateur mistakes. And I was like, it's okay. Everything's going to, you know, like I I now know I would never say those things. Those are like throwing logs on the fire. Those are trigger words. Yeah. And, you know, I even went in at one point. I was like, yeah, your teacher really is so awful and trying to like blend in. And that that made it worse. Mm -hmm. This was, this was quite a few years ago. And my mom. So what leaned should over you have me. done? Oh, sorry, finish the story. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So my mom leaned over to me and she was like, "Give space. Just don't go in. Give space. Give space. Give space. She will work through this. She'll ex- go a little more extreme. She'll do some weird behavioral stuff. She'll come down. She'll try to get you to like bring her back up into that place of extreme. Don't. Just give her space." And then she'll finally come down and act like nothing happened. And I was like, and no way. And it's exactly the cycle. Exactly what that, happened. Yeah. Like I always say my to mom, my, your mom yeah. said, like I always say to my four kids who actually all work with me, yeah. three of them full time, is that mom always yeah. knows best. I mean, there you just gave it away again. <laughs> 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 totally unrelated she, to our she conversation. Did in but this I circumstance. Did. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she said, you know, Scott, teenagers invented drama. They did. And she was like, you should write a chapter in your book about that. And this was years ago when I was planning to write the yeah. book. And so like, it's, it's not so off that when we look at some of those words, we go, oh, that's really familiar in a certain mm-hmm. age level that we see more, there's more permission, or we just assume that that's kind of the developmental stage of kind of like the teenage trauma. Yeah. I think there's a whole network on television that's dedicated to teenage trauma. I don't think I'm going to say the network, <laughs> but we, yeah, in American yeah. television, there's an entire network dedicated yeah, to it. Exactly. And it's also a way for them to process, maybe seeing that is also a way for them to see what's happening. So yeah. it's a, a way yeah. of almost processing and venting as well. But that's okay. So that, that, that is, let's, uh, did you want to say something about that? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. There. Well, I'll just say seeing it is so hard. Seeing it is a delicate process because there's such a, already a wound and, and a self-esteem deflation mm-hmm. that when people say you're oversensitive, they already feel abandoned. So they might be signaling, hey, something feels off in, mm-hmm. in the way that you are responding to situations, but it's internalized as a, another form of hurt and abandonment and victimization. Mm-hmm. And we often are the, you know, those of us who are in an addictive pattern are often the last to know mm-hmm. because that is our baseline. It's the way we are existing 
to what I'm using air quotes here, functionally mm -hmm. in the world. It's our exactly. way of surviving. If you were working with someone now and, they, and they're manifesting with, you know, you've done the assessments and mm -hmm. they're at this mm -hmm. point and you know that this is the case, like maybe that whatever, whatever situation, because yeah. you've, you've obviously got some clients, you're obviously not going to share their name, but yeah. what would you do then? How would you start helping them to start teaching? Yeah. A so identifying that poor trauma yeah. and resetting the baseline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we might start with some simple practices of just going, feeling some ground and, and allowing ourselves to actually feel states of stress. And often in, in the calming or the grounding work, they'll start to get distracted or start to get wiggly in their body. And we'll just name that, oh, there's something kind of wiggly or it's, it's hard to settle here. Can we just notice mm -hmm. that? And then we start to use that information. Oh, I noticed you were settled a moment, more settled a moment ago, and something is bringing you up and out of it. And we might call that revving. So in the book, that's one of the stages of drama mm -hmm. is revving ourselves up. And I might slow down. I'll use a lot of like slowing down. So I notice there's a lot of energy in the story that you're sharing. Would it be okay if we just slow down for a brief moment? Oh, that's really hard. What happens when we slow down? Mm -hmm. What is it that we're, what is it that we might be trying to avoid in keeping this speed? And oh, I or I noticed we got some level of settling here as we were processing this, and then you jump to something else. Mm -hmm. And even asking the question, "What was that like for you to jump to something mm -hmm. else? How did that support you in the moment?" So I'm using positive language. Yeah. There's a way, there's such a, a, a sensitivity here because there's been mm -hmm. such a feeling of being attacked by the world. Yeah. That positive reframing it in positive ways is so important to the development of unraveling this addiction to drama. Mm. So, so it's a, I really once they've understand. Yeah. That, yeah. So once they've, you've got them slowing down. Yeah. From the mm -hmm. revving up, that's a really interesting point. Now, you, you, in yeah. in the book, you do talk about like you talk, giving an example now of you working with someone in therapy. But in the book, you give techniques to help yourself. So these techniques that we're talking about now, so the way yeah. that you have, just so that people know that there's real mm -hmm. practical stuff. I'm just going back to yeah. you. Your first part, you talk about. You know, we've discussed quite a lot about what is this concept of addiction to drama, and then you go into the causes, which is the traumas and so on, mm -hmm. and the cycle, and then you go into the journey of healing which is breaking, finding, yeah. releasing, and learning stories of healing, milestones of healing. I wanted to quickly yeah. ask you too, a couple of, I know you've already answered that, the global drug of drama, you've answered that, yeah. you've already re 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 referenced that. Breaking, yeah. finding, releasing, and learning stories of healing. So you've explained now to help people to just gather awareness, ground in their body, when they're revving up yeah. to slow down. The next, so in this third part, you, you're basically helping them to help themselves as well, or help yeah. others, depending on, it may be helping themselves and others, or yeah. one or the other so what would, yeah. what is the next stage after the revving slowing down mm -hmm. of the revving after up? recognizing revving yeah so after recognize it then we start to integrate more of the practices that give us the space to start to go underneath the baseline oh, what do those look like what yeah so that might be feelings of disappointment as opposed to rage that might be sadness as opposed to anger. You know, it, it's not that anger or rage or are inappropriate emotions. It's just mm -hmm. when they become the default emotions, the depository for all other emotions that can't be felt or expressed. So we're we're opening up the rainbow of emotions, which is a, a, when we do that, when we actually come into our feelings, our fundamental primary feelings then they often metabolize, they move through much faster than what we call a secondary emotion. A secondary emotion is when we aren't able to feel the primary feeling, anger, sadness, joy, disgust, disappointment, whatever the emotion is. And because of so much suppression and repression that we deposit every ounce of energy into something that we can express, like anger, and it's not true to the experience or to the moment. Mm, but it's, we, as you we say, it's the, rep it the, the repository, yeah. it grabs it because it's the one that's become that part of that 
baseline default Absolutely. mode of operating. Yeah. And you yeah. can't, you can't process and you can't metabolize a secondary emotion. Mm-hmm. You can't metabolize a depository. So you can only take, process and metabolize a primary emotion. Primary. So you've got to get beyond those and recognize the primary. And then what do you do once you've, yeah. what you've, I mean, we're just giving a broad walk through. Yeah. Yeah. So once you've so done once that. we've expanded the, the palette of what emotions they can feel and express, then we can start to go back into the trauma itself. Because there's a vehicle for them to process through the things that have not been processed. All that isolation pain, all that pain, all that disconnect from their body Mm -hmm. that they've experienced, the numbing. So we have to move through layers of numbing slowly, surely into starting to feel what is the actual original story. So what actually happened, the actual, to take them down slowly into the state of, uh, into the actual story that happened, the yeah. experience that happened. Mm-hmm. And then that's... So that's sometimes because, mm-hmm. there are no memories. There are no actual autobiographical memories of the experience. So we go into the body, the, the memory of the body, into mm-hmm. what we call the implicit. Yeah. And the procedural memories, those that have become mm-hmm. patterned in our body and the sensations and the feelings that are attached to that, that sometimes have the actual beginning, middle, end story and sometimes mm-hmm. don't. And you have bits and pieces, yeah. Yeah, often it's only bits and pieces. Yeah. And sometimes that's what they'll have and they have to move on from that. So when you get to that point where, because not everyone, I'm very glad you brought this up, not everyone's going to get the full, every memory, every detail, every part of the root. And that's something that we may just get a glimpse and it may take years for that to come. But just the exercise of doing what they're doing, yeah. this whole process that you've taken them through, you started to look, you've gone beyond the baseline and you've started giving them a reason to think, okay, there's another way of functioning. So I, yeah. I wanted to really stress that or ask you if that's what you're stressing here is sometimes you won't get all the autobiographical memories. You're not going to see yeah. every single thing inside those thoughts. You may only get bits and pieces and it takes a little bit of time, but that doesn't mean yeah. that you can't learn how to use the drama in a more positive way. So that's something yeah. I assume with your healing stories or the yeah. milestones of healing, if we can sort yeah. of wrap up with how would yeah. you, let's say that we've got to whatever level of identification of the trauma, whether it's just a brief glimpse into knowing, okay, something mm-hmm. happened, or it's mm-hmm. full-on detail, whichever version, yeah. there's a yeah. realization that the drama is coming from that. Then what yeah. is the sort of healing story that the person is going to work with? What's the next step sort of stage after that? In broad yes. wrap, just to wrap up this conversation. Yeah. So. One of the ways after we processed maybe a core wound, the sort of engine for the pattern, as we might say, then we actually have to go back and address the identity formation. Because we've, we've, from the pattern, from the, excuse me, from the core wound, we've developed belief systems. We've developed compensational or adaptive patterns or behaviors. And we've, on top of that, developed an identity an identity of how we experience ourselves in the world and how we think the world perceives us and the interaction of that. Mm-hmm. And so one of the, the pieces that's actually sometimes harder to let go of than the actual trauma itself is the identity formation we've, we've formed around that. The internalized belief, I'm a victim to the world. I, be, I don't belong. Because... That's a belief system. That's an identity that we walk around with that we have to start to let go, that we have to start to believe something else is growing out of that fertile ground to which we did all that healing work in. Wonderful. That's, that's great. Well, can you, could you, that's, can you give, just wrap up with like a, just a quick sort of overview maybe of a little story in your own mm-hmm. life or something, just a quick one or two minutes just yeah. to kind of pull this all together in terms of being addicted to drama. Yeah, sure. Maybe a, a story of a client that I, yeah, that's whichever. in the book. And yes, you've got lots of stories thing. in the book, which is helpful. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's helpful to see examples. And one of the stories I think of that comes first to mind is a, a woman I worked with for years in which she came in and she would talk about a story and she would repeat the story over and over again. And often I would ask her, how many times have you told this story today? 
and she would say maybe eight to 10 times. And, and I would say, and how does the story change every time you tell it? And what's it like to tell it to me now? And she would often just cry. There was never any anger. Mm -hmm. There was never any other emotion. So it became relatively clear that crying, and I wouldn't even call it sadness. I would call it a big expression with tears. Mm -hmm. was this, was that depository, mm -hmm. that place that was the secondary emotion. And Absolutely. so it took quite a few years to, for her to recognize how she was revving herself up away from her authentic experience. And the when she revved herself up big enough, it, it exploded into these big tears, which made it harder for us to actually go back and find who she was and how she was feeling and what she really needed underneath that to be seen mm -hmm. and acknowledged and validated and met. Mm, and I love and it manifested in her relationships. It manifested in her, at her work. She was a journalist in very dangerous places in the world, mm. and she so felt she was like living that a was life of purpose. drama. Mm -hmm. She was living a life of drama, and coming away from those places felt dangerous to her. She mm. felt like she had no purpose in the world. That she was nothing if she wasn't doing that. Mm. So it took years, a few few years, but I I had spoke to her recently and she talked about how easeful relationships are now, mm. how she can Wonderful. just sit there and feel the love of someone else and off and express it back without revving herself up, without that. having to create all these blocks between her and other people and how she felt she went to a, a meditation retreat. And she told me that she was like, it was so easy. I could settle and then settle more and settle more. And I didn't have that alarm system that would go off that said resting or ease is dangerous. That's and beautiful. So what a, a lovely story. Yeah. That's really amazing. And I think that just that sense of peace is a great mm -hmm. way to wrap up the, the conversation yeah. that there's hope. And yeah. that it's one way, because a lot of the things you've described can be, can manifest in a multiplicity of different addictions. So to look at mm -hmm. drama as one of those, I'm mm -hmm. sure is, is, is a very big eye opener for a lot of people. So thank you, Scott, for writing the book and for sharing your wisdom and sharing this time with us today. It's been really so fascinating. Mm, thank you so much.